So here we are. We come to the to the very end. And again, I'm personally both exhausted and very grateful for this whole encounter with you all. It's been a very rich time, and I think I speak for, for the faculty as well, that they've been, um, yes, just grateful for the chance to present these ideas of the Hildebrand, and, um, grateful for your responsiveness. Um, we were surprised at the wonderful evenings we had with you all, and, uh, and certainly are inspired to continue this in, in future summers, and perhaps even beyond that in, in other times of the year and in multiple locations. So, so we thought that we would use the, this is sort of the last formal opportunity to speak with our panel and to raise questions. Um, obviously, informally, we can continue, and we would encourage you to, of course, be in touch with us, be in touch with the faculty with questions that come to you afterwards. That's how this often goes. You, there's so much that's given that the questions only somehow begin to come. This, this is my experience. That after each one of your presentations, I was so sort of uh, enriched by the ideas and reminded of the Hildebrands. Um, important insights, and then in the hallway, I had my question. So maybe you all have that experience as well. So, um, so I think we won't maybe go too long. I, I can see a certain amount of battle weariness here, but why don't we go for maybe thirty minutes um, and simply have uh, some questions in a concluding sort of way? Um, I could raise one, or if there's anything, and I know you could, you have an idea that you would like to raise. But if there's anything in particular on your minds that you'd like to ask. Um, I was wondering if there's been any investigation into the relationship between Carmelite spirituality and John Hildebrand's approach to the heart. It oh. seems like so much of the language is from John of the Cross or oh. That's a very interesting question. And it's a question for my wife. Uh, uh, here, who, who knows von Hildebrand uh, very thoroughly and at the same time is it deep into Carmelite spirituality? So, um, and you've often uh, uh, thought well, about. I, I find often that there is a, precisely a certain deficiency. I'm a, a third or I'm a secular Carmelite because I see Saint John, Saint John of the Cross is deeply informed by t scholastic um, language and the background when he when he philosophizes when he gives his commentaries. The poetry seems to be totally in line with von Hildebrand's ideas, but when the explanations come the passions and the emotions are not seen in their rational relationship to the objects. So the whole uh, new idea of von Hildebrand that it's an intentional relationship to an outside object that informs even the structure of the heart is not there. So sometimes I find the, and plus another thing that's missing is the whole idea between value response versus uh, being motivated by the subjectively satisfying. And so sometimes I find the kind of abnegation that's required is too much across the board. And there's a certain humanity that every human person ought to develop in responding to authentic value that is maybe seen too much in light of something that needs to be clipped and stripped. And so I wish, I'm hoping, that there will be more information because there seems to be, there's a very fruitful possibility of, of dialogue and mutual information that will just enrich both Carmelite spirituality and the understanding of another one. That's why I am. Do you, do you think Edith Stein? I think Edith Stein, Stein, there is something in her Science of the Cross where she begin, She lays out first the teaching of St. John of the Cross and then she has something on the development of what the self is, which goes beyond, I would say. Uh, but I don't know if she has, uh, she was so deeply in that spirit, you know, and she died before she could finish all she would have had to say. So I don't know if it's quite accomplished yet, even in her. Thank you. Thank you. There maybe must be other final questions. Yes, Amanda. I have more of a practical question that I thought of in the session right before the break. And I guess I'm just looking for, like, I haven't found a satisfactory philosophical, we've kind of touched on it, but philosophical argument of um, just one time I was, we were sitting with a group of people, and um, and this one man, we were talking about morality, and, and, and this one man said to me uh, that he's glad that his wife slept around before they were married, because then she knows for sure that she wants to be with him, you know, it's just another <laughs> which I know it sounds totally ridiculous, and, I, and, and he's not a believer at all, and so I was trying to 
you know, I really was trying to bring in what I knew at that point, especially theology of the body, but from a purely philosophical standpoint, I mean, I know we've kind of touched on, obviously, points on it this week, but what would be, like, a good... It's just that that comment has always just bothered me, and I didn't know, like, just what to say to him, on, on especially at, at the end of this week of, of everything we've learned. Of, obviously, that's not right, but how to just convey that yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or anyone of you all uh, want to help Amanda out using the resources of the Builder Brain to um, respond to that challenge that, that it was good to sleep around uh, because she allegedly uh, discovered that she really just wanted him and wouldn't have been able to figure that out without a promiscuous period in her life. All right, let's see you all go to work on, on that bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so I would just suggest maybe thinking of it. You know, Wine Hildebrand has such a big emphasis on just the personal uh, subjective and objective res- um, the personality between just two people and to suggest like a plurality in the heart of like so many different loves in that way and that intimacy necessarily means you degrade it in a sense because the heart was made for one person I guess Brian Hildebrand would, would think yeah alright uh, uh, I, I wonder what the uh, what the evolution of the husband was did he uh, I mean of the wife did she repent of her promiscuity and and realize, no, this is not the way to do it. I should live with one person? Or uh, was it a kind of, without any repentance, just saying, well, I, I sorted out uh, who it is that I really like. Who. I think that's what it was. Yeah. They're fully immersed in the culture, living the culture. of just yeah. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Mm. But now we're married. So, mm. Yeah, yeah Chase. Um, we did discuss this aspect of the nature of love, but um, the enthronement of the beloved, um, there's an aspect that uh, Hogan brings up that in the love relationship, the, the beloved is enthroned, yeah. um, and uh, you interpret the other from above, but um, especially you're, so much is given to the beloved effectively in this, in this response that this is the only one, in a sense, this, there's this deep experience in the aff- affections, that this is the only one, and so when you fall out of love, there's still that residue, there's still that um, imprint on the heart of this one, and, and there's a brokenness there. Um, and so there's there's an inability, in a sense, to experience um, the full depths without without some deep healing um, of that relationship again with someone else. I would also look at the, um, the superactuality of love in that case, um, because um, as is often the case with, with those who have had previous serious relationships, many serious relationships. You know, when you're with the new beloved, uh, um, memories of the old beloved come to mind, uh, and it's it's very hard to have that full personal response when um, you've shared that such a deep secret of yourself with so many people that um, in your affections and your memories, um, the previous beloveds. Um, are, are, are still there. There's, there's something where you, you have squandered yourself and um, without a deep healing, as you said, I'm you know, wondering, did she repent of that? Um, there needs to be a kind of healing and a kind of recognition that she needs to possess herself again in a, in a very serious way, which, which is um, hindered by, that, by many serious relationships. She has to possess herself again in order to give herself completely to one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, spoken in the spirit of uh, many of the themes we've explored this week. So, anybody else? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I would have asked many questions at this point, so I think that that would have been very beneficial or very fruitful. But I'm wondering whether or not. Um, it might be coming from an attitude where I do think that, for example, in our day and age, there is, I mean, such 
an overemphasis, but also in that, I mean, there's always, I think, a truth in everything. There is kind of also an appreciation of the physicality or the kind of the physical attractiveness maybe of, you know, that, that goes in um, to marriage, and that is also an important factor. And I'm wondering whether or not this is something that maybe Mark Roberts might have touched upon or Dr. Roberts the other day when he said, you know, there are other considerations for marriage. Now, I don't think that one would have had to go to that point um, and I would, I, it would seem wrong to me to suggest that, you know, now this is the reason why she knows that this is the one. And yet, perhaps, if what's being implied by that, you know, is that, I mean, again, one, you know, I think that maybe the, um, the difficulty with the philosophy of it is that when it focuses on the essence and the nature of love, you know, that it, it, it focuses on, on certain aspects. And, I mean, this is also a very important one um, that it can't philosophically, of course, I think, expound on as much or, or unwrap. So I would wonder, you know, is that perhaps what led him or her to say that? Um, I don't know. Yeah, so I'll make a comment, and then I'm going to leave another question. Um, my first exposure to Hildebrand has been preparation of this conference, so I'm still very new. Um, this whole week I've kind of been in the back of my mind thinking of the, uh, the opening line to Anna Karenina when it says that all happy families are the same, each unhappy family is unhappy in their own way. Um, and thinking about, you know, we've, we've brought up Hildebrand's seeming, you know, romanticism or he seems to, to idealize the, the very positive aspects, and we have touched on sort of the source of a lot of the negative um, in a very, in, in terms of um, piety or reverence to the person, and I think all these are very, very useful. Um, but I wonder if in Hildebrand's other work, is there more sort of phenomenological attention given to what happens when we depart from the way things ought to be. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, in uh, the great work of um, Hildebrand, uh, maybe one of his two or three greatest works, Transformation in Christ, you have an approach to the Christian virtues, like meekness, say, which where, where, where Hildebrand works out in Christian virtue by considering all different kinds of things that look like the virtue but really aren't. And so you can derive a lot of practical help. Or the chapter on humility. Servility is not humility. And with contrast after contrast, mm -hmm. uh, he works out the true nature of humility. And uh, through all those resourceful contrasts, you, uh, well, I and many readers of the Hildebrand say that we see ourselves, you know, in all of the aberrant forms um, <laughs> of missing the virtue, uh, but uh, there's a lot of practical help to be derived from that approach to the different Christian virtues as you have it in transformation in Christ. Yeah, that's very helpful, and I think that, that can also kind of apply to the situation. Yeah. Another work along the same lines is Graven Images. Um, which I find very illuminating. Yeah. Now, I know John Denver, you have... Uh, well, it, it's maybe just a, a, a question I'll put to the panel in the spirit of, of just summarizing uh, one of the many important insights of Hildebrand. I think it was Maria, well, really both of you who spoke on, on the theme of affectivity, but you have presented on, on this. And, you know, the... Uh, in the sp very much in the spirit of this seminar is to try to really lay bare the, the, the uh, contributions of the Hildebrand, particularly the ideas that are not just derivative but that are original. And I wanted to see if perhaps the panel could just comment again on uh, the, the aspect of a real breakthrough in his thought on, on affectivity, particularly on, on uh, spiritually motivated effective responses. Uh, it's come up several times uh, in, in, in our conversations, and maybe the point is not so much to contrast this with the Thomistic view or the Aristotelian view, but simply to try to state again the, uh, the, the particular point of, of, of insight. And I would say that I, there, there have been a few moments where 
comments have been made that have that have suggested that it, even in light of the presentation of Ben Hildebrand's thought here, there's still we we still sort of um, somehow regress to the idea that that affectivity is to be understood in terms of cause and effect or stimulus and response, and this is precisely not what Ben Hildebrand has in mind. So perhaps just um, any of you to, to, to uh, yes to somehow uh, perhaps resummarize this idea or to help. Um, make this, this, this contribution distinct. It seems to me that one can't really do justice to his thought on love if one doesn't really understand his, under, his contributions on affectivity, and that's why this would be so important in conclusion. Right. Well, there's, there's much to be said here, but, um, and, and it was just already said by, by Pia, the, 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 what is, um, what makes his thought on the, on, uh, the affections, uh, on affective experiences, so unique, so original, I think, is precisely what you just said, developing the, uh, them or articulating why and um, uh, describing why they are personal stances, personal responses. That is to say, uh, based on a cognition, very often a kind of felt cognition, but nevertheless a real cognition of the value and goodness and beauty of an object, which then elicits a personal response, not merely a reaction, a sensuous physical reaction, but a fully personal or spiritual reaction to that um, object, which um, is, is not free in the same way as an act of the will is free. And one way in which you could perhaps um, highlight that this is not just a reaction, not just a stimulus in the biological sense, is by um, showing that in some ways the, the act of knowledge is very similar. It's not as if I can simply decide uh, to think that there are thousands of people here listening to me talk, right? Uh, knowledge, too, is a response to a perception not something that I freely decide. I find myself in front of a certain reality, and I have a cognitive, not a response in this case, first there's a reception. That reception is entirely, not just rational, but entirely personal, deeply personal. It's a personal act, and yet it's not something which is in my immediate control. And so, um, that's just one, one way of bringing out how deeply personal it is. Usually, philosophers recognize that this kind of rationality is uh, not a bodily thing. Clearly, that's not just a bodily thing, but it shares that one characteristic of the effective life that Van Hildebrand brings out, namely that it can't simply be the result of a deliberate decision on my part. That's precisely why we, why we um, find it hard to believe sometimes certain things that we wish we could believe. Right? So, I'll just leave it at that, but of course there's much more to be said. Yeah, uh, on that idea of stimulus and response, um, but Hildebrand has very helpful contrasts between real personal affectivity and instances of mere cause response. So, for instance, uh, cause affective reaction, I should rather say. He, he mentioned, for instance, the euphoria cause alcohol or depression caused by too little sleep. And that is all in contrast to, uh, let's say, some joy that's motivated by some good I've understood. So that difference between what works on my affective system by way of natural causality and what works on me by way of motivation, personal motivation, that's a fundamental chasm that was a something that played a very great role at the beginning of phenomenology, that distinction between natural causality and motivation. And um, Hildebrand has thought through that idea of motivation in the higher reaches of the affective life, and that's part of his recovery of affectivity. Well, perhaps just one last note is that I think the richness that we've been trying to emphasize this last week so that it somehow brings a wealth, like a kind of a, it, it adds something really to the, the personal experience, but also his analysis of the connection between the real self and affectivity and, 
and somehow it opens up. That was my that was my attempt to show how it really opens <coughs> up new dimensions in ethics, new dimensions in kind of an anthropological understanding of the human person, even a new kind of understanding, even metaphysical understandings. That um, it it really is sort of. And, and when he says that love is, you know, primarily this affective, it, it requires for its fullness an affective plenitude. Um, and then the question, of course, was, and this was the question that was put to Hildebrand, what is the role of the will, or how does the will play in, and is that something that needs to be developed more? And yet, regardless of even if that needs to be developed more, I think that there is much value and much um, to be said for his contribution um, for including that in love. Maybe on this subject of the heart. Yes, Mark. Oh, it's no, not. No, it's another subject. No, it's it fine. is. Oh, it is? Okay. Um, and it, it may, this question may, in fact, not really be a question because it may be that it's coming out of things I've misunderstood. Um, but so I was thinking about sort of union, union, especially um, between spouses, mm -hmm. union and, and conjugal love. And so this union is comes from the disclosing of the self. Um, so from, sort of from, from each, right, each person's seeing, seeing the other person. In his, in his personhood, maybe. And if what it is to be a person is to be something sort of deep and incommunicable, such that it seems that you can never really fully know another person, can this union ever really be completely fulfilling? Does that mean the question? So, so if, if what it, if what this union, this union comes from a desire to know the other fully. But in fact, you can't ever know a person fully. And I, it's not necessarily, I mean, it actually seems to me like there's a lot of food for thought there. It's not necessarily a criticism. But is that, yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I'm reminded of a, a line in Newman where he says, it doesn't trouble the Christian to think that he can come to love God still more, ever more, without end. And so, in human relations, too, perhaps uh, a certain inexhaustible mystery of, of a loving person, so that you never uh, have a kind of finished uh, grasp, uh, but uh, always grow more deeply into the mystery of a beloved person that is uh, perhaps just a sign of the personal plenitude of, uh, of the deeper forms of human life, uh, and not really an obstacle for a Interest. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so I think that, uh, that a certain um, inexhaustible uh, fullness of, of, of the other is expressed in your question, which, uh, uh, to my mind, needn't interfere at all. Love and maybe even explain the dynamism whereby both can go over. Can it, it, even in the deep relations of love, after all, use a lot of stereotypes. So oh, the other always does that, and she's up to this or that pattern <laughs> of behavior again, and often on blocks, you know, a real encounter. Uh, the other, Kevin, you're s smiling in a knowing way, as if you have something to add. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I appreciate your, your comment. I think my smile. <laughs> By the way, on, on a more anecdotal or back to the Hildebrand's life, there's a, there's a wonderful passage in the memoirs where he's um, he's already left Germany to go to Austria, and, but he's he travels to France, and uh, he has a chance of meeting Gabriel Marcel, the philosopher, for the, for the first time. But he's with another French writer whose name escapes me now, who's a, a brilliant personality, sparkling wit. And Marcel, um, if any of you have seen pictures of him, certainly wasn't 
didn't have that kind of uh, appearance, and he was uh, wasn't uh, he was more reserved, and and it just didn't uh, make much of an impression on Van Hildebrand. But Van Hildebrand said later on, he says in his memoirs then that it took him uh, many years to realize that he'd been in the company of a great personality, and then he takes himself to task, and he says, "I realized in hindsight how often we block out a real openness to the other when we're preoccupied with our own concerns." And so this this brilliant writer who'd invited him, I, surely there was some kind of agenda that Van Hildebrand was fulfilling, but there was in his presence, in a way, the much greater philosopher. Um, and I think that, first of all, that's typical of Van Hildebrand, that he would be, he would live in this kind of uh, self-critical honesty, but it gets to your point, I think, that, um, yes, that, that we, we are often blocked by our projects and stereotypes and the like. But it's a lovely anecdote. I, I have to say the memoir, when it does come out, will be not only a tremendous document from the point of view of Catholic history and the re history of resistance during the war, but it will also be a tremendous human story uh, of, a, of a great man. You know, he wrote it for his wife, this memoir, for Alice, because she was so much younger. And so she hadn't lived with him during this period, and so she asked one day if he would write the memoir. And, uh, he, as she likes to say, he wrote in characteristic German fashion, he wrote 5,000 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but the amazing thing about these 5,000 pages, of which I've seen a few, a few thousand, and some of them are still being kept by Alice and Hildebrand because of very personal things, but that it's a real page turner, you know, whether, it, whether he's running from the Nazis or it's just these kind of descriptions of human encounters with great, um, uh, you know, great detail, and I mean, these are all written, you know, 40, and 50, well, 30 years later after the experiences, but the, um, the, the, the human dimension and the spirit of, 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 of sort of honesty with which he wants to tell his wife a story. And you know, memoirs are often written to establish one's legacy. You know, you think of a kind of presidential library, and it's the point is to somehow assure the, the legacy of the, of, the, of the president. And in this case, you have very much the feeling that it's almost a kind of confessional document. So there are these tremendously heroic moments where he simply tells what happened, and it's very impressive. But then there's also this willingness to take himself to task in you know, beautiful ways, really. So. There's perhaps also uh, still the, um, the the negative way uh, comment in, in response to this, and that is supposing that uh, there wasn't always more to know. I think that would be a very arg very good argument not to get married. Uh, it, it, I remember one time um, hearing from my father uh, the story of somebody who, after I forget 25 years of marriage, um, was explaining that he got a divorce and my father was surprised and said why and he said well I just finished the book and um, <laughs> it always struck me as so tragic at this I mean from all sorts of uh, perspectives but this idea that you could finish the book is very depersonalizing and uh, and it would be I think a very good reason to say no <laughs> let's let's not get married forever let's see Yes, Andrew. Small personal story that may, you know, have a germ of merit for what we've been talking about. My wife told me at one point that I was the answer to her prayers, and I felt wonderful. And then she said, "You're not exactly what I prayed for, but <laughs> <laughs> you are the answer." <laughs> So I think the point is uh, <laughs> you can make the best of a bad situation. <laughs> yeah, Ken? Maybe the reason I was smiling is because I was thinking about this. So the, the question about how we know the beloved that von Hildebrand talks about there can be this initial experience where the beloved is revealed and all of their uh, beauty, but yet there's also the experience that you get to know your spouse more and more and more. So there's a, uh, there could be maybe a phenomenology of disclosure that could be unpacked there. And an analogy that was in my head was uh, a mountain that has no top, maybe, or you, you, you look at the mountain and there's this, I see the whole mountain, but uh, there's a sense in which you don't. You could walk up the path and climb and there's a whole uh, another side to you see it, the whole thing, and yet you don't see the whole thing uh, at the same time. Yeah. For a cyclist like myself, that's a terrible analogy. <laughs> <laughs> a mountain that has no top. <laughs>
maybe also in a more just back to Sharif's presentation, maybe that also says something about our conversation, Sharif, regarding the um, the way in which perhaps stages of conjugal love don't immediately encompass the, the desire for bodily union, that there's a kind of disclosure that has to happen. That's conju- and, and, and again, to the point that conjugal love has a kind of ability, to, it, it has an empowering ability or, or a disclosing ability, so that perhaps this is, um, it certainly seems very much in the spirit of Hildebrand, and, and, and in some ways perhaps it's, it's there. So I, I, I like that. And in the spirit also of, again, sort of doling out career advice, someone should write a dissertation on the phenomenology of cl- disclosure in Van Hildebrand. <laughs> so we'll, we'll help you in whatever way we can. But, uh, I must admit that the Hildebrandian idea that it's possible in one brief encounter with another person, the opposite sex, to get a kind of vision of that person that makes you fall in love in a really valid way that will last. I'm a little leery of I think that uh, uh, Olson, in the uh, uh, critical review of uh, his marriage book, raised a good point. He, he said, what we can grasp all at once is an idea, uh, a, a form, a, a person, you know, who has a story and has this mystery of inscrutable freedom. I mean, that's not so readily graspable so that the love can be born in, in a single encounter. Uh, really last. I, I, I tend to think that the uh, coming to know the other person, and he's thinking there especially of the spousal relation, is after all something that takes its time and doesn't uh, lend itself to quite such a dramatic moment of illumination uh, as, as he assumes. So I tend to think. I'm sort of a defender of this idea of the world because, because I think, well, because I think that. Um, and again, I mean, we can't sort of generalize our experiences too much, and, and uh, also it took me over 10 years to marry the person I'm married to now, so <laughs> I can't claim to have seen it all at once. But at the, sa- at the same time, there, there, uh, to sort of argue for what he's after, I think he wants to say, though, that there's a way, and maybe, maybe the mistake is to read it too much in terms of an emphasis on knowing the person, but there's something, there has to be a kind of an encounter at some point where the person is really given in their way, as a person, in, in, in a thematic way. And I think in that sense, I would sort of defend that whether that happens at the very first encounter or somewhere along the way, there's some... I like this idea somehow that, that once something, even a kind of preliminary or incipient form of conjugal love forms, that it does provide, in a, in a way, a kind of insight into the person that no other encounter or love, even love of friendship. I mean, Sharif, we could debate that in the sense that I, I think that um, while... Clearly, other loves. L- love is always somehow illuminating when it's not obviously um, when it's when it's rooted in, in, in the person and not in our image of the person, for example. But it seems to me that um, there's something perhaps uniquely powerful in in conjugal love, even in its incipient forms, for providing this kind of yes, this 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 real sense of the other in the whole. So I I, I and I think it's. Um, I, I think in the end it's a very valuable contribution of the Hildebrand, but probably worth modifying or qualifying rather than, mm. than rejecting. Yeah. But I am sort of a romantic at heart. <laughs> There's nothing I, I dislike more than, uh, than sort of the mundane. I'd rather live in, in, in a state of idealism and, and, and sort of bump into reality occasionally. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm on your side and I'm a very sober Dutchman, so. Yes, you.
of the understanding of the beloved person beyond this first moment of illumination would need to be done as she did. So, um, one uh, thing I might just throw out uh, and, um, and not try to work through with you now, but let me just remind you of where our seminar started. Um, we started on Monday morning with the discourse of Kierkegaard. Uh, in which Kierkegaard claims the only kind of love that really merits the name of love is love of neighbor. And he argues that all human love being preferential is, after all, uh, self-centered, uh, selfish, and in a Christian perspective, he says, dethroned, only love of neighbor remains as really valid love in a Christian setting. And I open with that because it's so antagonist to the uh, view of the Nildebrand. And now, at the end of the seminar, I would think you've got a lot of, a lot of good uh, reasons for doubting that Kierkegaardian disparagement of human love. And uh, one way of thinking of Nildebrand is uh, as a defender of the, uh, the dignity of human love against that kind of uh, moralizing suspicion expressed in the discourse of Kierkegaard. So I'm just leading you back here at the end to the point from which we started uh, on Monday. Seems to me a great ending to the seminar. <laughs> Are you assuming that you've convinced our, our attendees that the dignity of human love are they all secretly still... Oh, we still have one person. <laughs> I just have one thing to say about that. Yeah. Is that Kierkegaard, unfortunately, didn't pay enough attention, I think, to the story with its Samaritan, which contextualizes and concretizes the love of neighbor, in which it was the Samaritan who came upon <coughs> the man who beat him. Uh, and was moved with compassion at the sight. Um, and then he approached the victim. And that word, moved, uh, compa moved with com compassion, in the Greek has the, the sense of, of uh, moved from the deepest part, from, from the bowels. And that it seems that the vision of the neighbor should elicit this from us, that is the need of our mother and sister, even if we haven't met them. The, the, the example which Christ himself uses and is, is an example of a value response. Here, I mean, it doesn't say the value response. Yeah, yeah. But, um, the love of neighbor, and that, that is the yeah. parable which gives us the vision of who is my neighbor, uh, is, is not one of duty, this is I'm, what I'm going, what I ought to do, but is one of a human experience in which I just respond to the good of the other and love yeah. him as myself. Kierkegaard would say that was love of neighbor, and that's the one kind of love that he thinks uh, is recognized by the Christian, but it's this uh, but love, it's a love, love of friendship. It's a love which moves me in a way. Uh, I guess I'm thinking in a sense of the way in which Kant would, would say that movement. No, is, that's right. No. Well, Kierkegaard wasn't, right, he wasn't Kantian Kant. in that way, and so there's the effective dimension in the love of neighbor. That, that's true. But it, um, it lacks that particularity of love for a spouse, or love for a friend, or love for a child. And that's where Kierkegaard sees the, um, the, the selfishness, the incurable root of selfishness. And I think uh, there's any merit in the whole Hildebrandian philosophy of love, and the idea of value response. The heart of it, then, uh, has more to uh, human love. The great Kierkegaard had allowed. Oh, is that a good ending, uh, Jules? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so on that note.
I, I think we are really finished now. So could we give a round of applause to our...